Good morning. This is uh, a joint meeting of the Senate Judiciary Committee and the Senate Health and Welfare Committee um, coming to you on Thursday, April 29th, 2021 via Zoom and YouTube. Um, today's uh, topic is H-225, a bill that seeks to um, decriminalize possession of small amounts of buprenorphine or as many people know it, Suboxone. Um, and uh, Michelle Childs is gonna be late. She won't be here till probably nine o'clock. I'm gonna briefly run through the house bill. And then if you have questions, we can ask Michelle when she gets here. Um, but the house bill, um, its intent is to decriminalize possession of 224 milligrams or less of buprenorphine persons under the 21 years of age um, who possess it would be referred to court diversion for the purposes of enrollment and use substance abuse safety awareness. This is very similar to possession of other drugs by youth, um, marijuana, and et cetera. Persons under 16 would be treated um, as delinquency proceeding in the Family Division of Superior Court. Um, knowing an unlawful possession of more than 224 milligrams of buprenorphine would continue to be criminal and penalized in the same manner as other narcotics pursuant to 18 BSA 4234. Section two um, does what uh, the bill says, except that as I read it, and this is a question from the cell, um, it, it says shall not be punished in accordance with uh, person knowingly and unlawfully possessing 224 milligrams or less of buprenorphine shall not be punished in accordance with subdivision A of this subdivision. Um, and so I don't know what happens to them if they are caught with it. Um, so it sort of, in my mind, legalizes it. Um, as opposed to when we did the earlier versions of decriminalization of marijuana, we left, left it with a civil ticket, if you all recall, uh, for those over 21. Um, in this case, there doesn't appear to be any uh, anything. So for all intent and purposes, it would be legalized, in my view. Um, then um, it goes into the possession under 21, where they, uh, between uh, under 21, um, would uh, be committing a civil violation and subject to section 4230 um, of this title and a person under 16 uh, would be committing a delinquent act. And the bill takes effect on July 1, 2021. So our first witness this morning is State's Attorney Sarah George of Chittenden County. Good morning, sir. <clears throat> Welcome. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Joint meeting. Good. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am going to try to keep this brief so that I can answer any questions that you all have. Um, as, as most of you probably know, in 2018, I announced that I would no longer prosecute for misdemeanor possession of buprenorphine and related compounds uh, such as Suboxone. These drugs are intended to be life-saving. They are an integral part of medication-assisted therapy. They block the craving for heroin or other street opioids and therefore minimize the chance of relapse. They help individuals reduce or abandon their use of heroin or other opioids. So in return, people who are using buprenorphine or who are um, prescribed buprenorphine uh, are likely to commit less crimes. And there is a drastic reduction in fatal overdoses and recidivism. In the year that um, followed the implementation of my policy, the overdose fatalities in Chittenden County dropped by over 50%. Uh, although they were, we were the first jurisdiction in the country to stop prosecuting this opioid, uh, since then other jurisdictions around the country have followed suit. Um, most notably District Attorney Larry Krasner in Philadelphia and District Attorney Ellie Savitt in Michigan, both specifically recognizing Chittenden County's policy in their own. So I say that just to point out that for what Vermont does really does matter. Um, as small as we may be, our decisions do have a big impact and they send a bigger message. 
And the message here really is that we as elected officials are tired of simply saying that substance use disorder is a public mm -hmm. health issue um, and instead are implementing laws and policies that prove that we believe that. The bill is a modest step towards recognizing that harm, the harm that criminalizing substance use has had on individuals who use drugs. It tells people that use drugs that we care about them, that we want them to survive. And so when they're given an option of possessing heroin or possessing buprenorphine, not only do we want them, but we encourage them to possess the buprenorphine. When we implemented this policy in Chittenden, there was skepticism from some law enforcement, um, community members, and some legislators. But over time, as most things do, those concerns really have not been validated and the positives that we hoped for have been more than realized. Our overdose numbers drastically reduced, the number of doctors who could prescribe went up. And as an aside, I would just note that the previous barriers that were in the way of having more doctors be able to prescribe buprenorphine just this week were waived by the Secretary of Health and Human Services nationwide. And they specifically stated in that mandate that these perceived barriers to buprenorphine are aggravating the overdose epidemic. So given our size, Chittenden County was essentially a, a test study in using evidence-based research to make public health policies and decisions, and it worked. Um, it's my opinion that the state should follow suit, um, especially now um, when Vermont's overdose fatalities are up 38%, and nationally the overdose deaths have increased 26.8%. Um, in 2020, 88,000 people died from opioid overdoses. And I don't mean to sound overly dramatic, but waiting another year on this bill could quite literally cost lives. Um, since UVM Medical Center implemented their ER program to allow for quick prescriptions of buprenorphine, hospitals around the state have started to implement similar programs and I applaud them. Um, but I have heard from some folks that we should be satisfied with that or that it negates the need to decriminalize buprenorphine. So for anyone that might be wondering why I don't believe that um, or why folks can't just go to their local hospital and get a prescription, um, it's just not, it's not that easy. Um, and it's not how addiction works. First, you know, I don't believe that every county has a participating hospital, but even if they do, many don't have the same access to a hospital given more rural communities. And further, not everyone has the same experience with ERs. Um, they're very busy. Not everyone feels comfortable or safe, especially now, um, and especially folks with other health concerns. Going into emergency rooms is not an ideal circumstance for a lot of people. Many people have negative relationships or experiences with their local hospital. Transportation to hospitals is difficult, but perhaps more importantly, um, insurance. Um, a prescription does still require either a cash payment or insurance, and Many of the folks that we're attempting to save here don't have either. The reality in our communities is that it's easier for people to buy heroin than it is for them to even buy a diverted butte strip. So it's certainly easier for them to buy a diverted butte strip than it is to fight through the red tape to get a valid prescription at a hospital. And as elected officials, who want to keep our constituents alive, I believe we should be encouraging the possession regardless of how they came to possess it rather than thwarting it. Um, I have heard since implementing our policy from countless people who are now in recovery who say they started their path to recovery through non-prescribed buprenorphine. And you know, that is what we want. Um, that is harm reduction. And that is, in my opinion, public safety. The last thing I would just mention is that um, this is not a charge that is brought very often. Um, I don't know what other states attorneys, my understanding of from other states attorneys as well is that this isn't something we charge very often. And so some people might think, well, then why do we need to decriminalize it? But from my perspective, then why do we need it? Um, we are we have a really hard time with giving up things, um, giving up laws, especially, especially as prosecutors, because we think it's a tool. Um, it's one more thing in our tool belt that we need to use. And from my perspective, that's not how crimes should be used. That's not how laws should be used. And if we aren't using it and we don't charge it very often, 
um, then we should be getting rid of it because right now our laws treat it the same as possessing heroin and it's not the same. Um, we, we want people to be possessing this over heroin and right now when given the choice, people might pick heroin um, if the penalty is gonna be the same. So that's- I'm gonna try to keep questions to a minimum because we have a really packed agenda this morning. Yeah. I, I think the one question that I have for you, uh, State Attorney George, is did the House get the amount right? Would you be not prosecuting cases? And I have no idea how much, I'm yeah. going to be honest with you, the milligrams are tough for me. Um, I like ounces and cups and smear, and even a smidge is easier for me. Um, but uh, did they get it right in terms of the amount that they, um, you say decriminalize, I say legalize. I, I think so. I, I believe the um, 224 or 225 milligrams is about a two week supply, 10 day supply. Um, I think that that is reasonable. Um, I don't have any concerns about it. I think more than that, somebody could still have more than that, I'm sure for a personal use, but I, I have not seen that. Typically, people either have a few strips or they have hundreds that they're selling. That's helpful. Yeah. Do you, have you, um, never mind, I guess I didn't ask that question. Um, I just wondered if you prosecuted any large amounts. Yep, I have. And even since okay. my policy, I've um, two cases in particular where people had, it was, they were, there was a lot of other drugs that they possessed as well, um, hotel rooms that were full of drugs and, and I did charge the possession of the buprenorphine strips because I think he had a hundred. Thank you. Other questions for uh, State Attorney George? Sarah, thanks so much for being with you with us. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. Our next witness is David. Sh uh, excuse me, Michelle, you're here, and uh, thank you for for joining us again. Um, we appreciate it. We know. Um, we're all in the Zoom world. We're all stuck with various duties. Um, and uh, so thanks for being with us. I, um, I'm curious, we did a brief walk through the bill. Um, and I, I'm not, it's not clear to me, we, when we decriminalized marijuana, we, we gave civil tickets out instead of the criminal offense. And in this case, the House chose to um, just leave it, um, no punishment, which in my mind kind of legalizes it. Is that a, is that an apt term? And, and do you know what they went through? Before, you know, did, was there any discussion about civil tickets or any other method? My, my recollection was that there, there was a, a robust discussion, um, both in House Judiciary in 2019, because the bill had originated, the, the predecessor to 225 um, had originated in House Judiciary and passed out of House Judiciary, and then um, it went to Human Services. And so my recollection from last session was that there was a discussion about um, establishing civil penalties as opposed to the criminal penalties for that lower amount, but, um, but they chose to eliminate um, those penalties uh, because of, of I, probably some of the, the policy reasons that you're hearing from people who are advocating for taking away the penalties. Um, and uh, so right now, as the bill is structured, is that there would be no penalty for 21 and over for possession of the smaller amount. Um, and then if it's under 21, then they are referred uh, to diversion and the youth substance misuse awareness program that's run by the attorney general's office. And that uh, mirrors what we do with underage possession of cannabis and alcohol. Any questions for Michelle about <clears throat> Um, the next witness is David Scheer from the um, Attorney General. He's an Assistant Attorney General and Chief of Chief of the Community Justice Division. Community Justice Division. Excuse me. Thank you. I'll get this right eventually, David. Just a couple more years, we'll get there. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Senator. Thank you, committees, for taking up this bill. 
The Attorney General supports this bill, uh, thinks it's an important move forward towards a harm reduction approach to people who are suffering from substance use disorder. Uh, our office has worked hard in our own realms, such as diversion and pretrial services in Tamarack uh, since uh, 2017 or so to try to really make more robust the, our connections with the treatment community through those programs. Tamarack, thanks in fact to the Senate Judiciary Committee was uh, created in 2017, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2017 in order to create a section of diversion that was a version of diversion that was really directed towards treatment oriented approaches to individuals involved in the criminal system. We do think that this is a important move forward towards ensuring that uh, we are not criminalizing people who are possessing small amounts of a drug that can be life-saving and preventing them from using much more harmful, much more dangerous drugs, specifically heroin and uh, related compounds. And we are seeing right now a serious opiate uh, problem again in our state and around the country. We're not unique in this right now during the pandemic. And certainly we hope that as things open up again, we can renew some of the supports that had been in place to ameliorate that problem. But we think that this is an important move forward to make sure that people are not being punished for using an alternative that is much safer, much less harmful than what might, they might otherwise turn to. Uh, I don't think that, you know, I agree with a lot of the reasons that State Attorney George named. I think she did a great job summarizing some of the data and most recent input we've heard from national authorities on this as well. So I won't go over that again. I think that was very well stated uh, and we agree with those points as well. So. With that, I'm happy to take any questions and uh, thanks again to the committees for considering this. I guess my one question and my, my understanding from some in criminal justice is that, that somebody caught with a small amount of buprenorphine, this is used as a tool to get them into treatment. Is there any concern that people won't seek treatment and just continue to use? Um, and that they're not really, um, that they're still using um, heroin and other, but when they can't find it, they use this. Is there any concern on that, that this will um, lessen the, the treatment people might go to? I certainly think that we need to make more robust our ways of getting people connected to treatment. I don't think that we need to use the criminal system as the way to do uh, that. I think that we can um, ensure, do better in terms of making sure that public health resources are readily available for reference by police um, and by others in the community who may be in contact with individuals who are in need of that treatment. But I don't necessarily think uh, hanging a criminal charge over somebody is the best or even most particularly effective way to have them enter treatment in a way that is really something that sticks and is lasting, or at least is part of a process that is that is lasting. We understand that these things take quite a long time or can take quite a long time. So my answer is, I don't think that we are using a tool that is particularly, that is essential or particularly helpful. I think there are other ways that we can, and that I think is, agencies are already doing. I wanna give credit where it's due. I do think that, um, law enforcement agencies uh, are aware of these issues and are already working to create, in some places are working to create these connections. But I think going in that direction is the right way to go. And I, I don't wanna labor the point, but where do you get it? If it's not diverted from somebody else's prescription or it's not, you know, you didn't break into a pharmacy to get the the amount of buprenorphine that's now evil. You have to get it from somebody. It, it's still, I assume, still illegal from somebody to give this amount to somebody else or to sell it or whatever. So how do they get it if they're not either diverting it or stealing it from somebody else? Well, maybe that they've acquired it in some transaction with somebody else just paid for it. I mean, I, and I think what we're trying to do here is, and that other person may be somebody who's 
uh, involved in some other activity that allowed them to get it. I think what we're trying to do here by putting the, the, this amount in place is to create a distinction between people who are not involved in larger enterprise, commercial enterprises, not trying to do this for commercial gain uh, and prey on people who you know, need something um, that, that, that otherwise could be gotten through, uh, th through legal means. Um, I think, and so putting that cap on it tries to different, create that differentiation between those two types of individuals, those who are doing this for commercial gain and those who are doing this simply to help themselves. And I, I recognize that those sorts of numerical caps uh, can be a rough way of making that distinction, but it's, it's a reasonable way for a legislature to make those distinctions. And um, I think, you know, it'll be up to law enforcement as well to, and prosecutors to take cases as they come and see what is, uh, what is appropriate for things above that cap. But we do think that that is a way of making the distinction that's necessary between those two types of individuals who may be caught with it. Other questions for David? No. David, thanks so much. Good to have you. Thank you. Um, our next witness, uh, John Campbell has politely declined. Um, so Dennis White, I'm sorry, Dennis, the state attorney from Madison County. Maybe Senator Hardy should introduce you and I'd get the name right. That's all right, Senator. Thank you. Um, it's actually the last name is Wigman's. Wigman's. Uh, okay, thank you. Weichmann in the old country, but uh, here in America, we call it Wigman's. Um, thank you for having me today. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, similarly to uh, State's Attorney <clears throat> George, in Addison County, we declined uh, to prosecute uh, misdemeanor possession of buprenorphine uh, back in 2019. I say declined to prosecute, um, which is really uh, not accurate um, because in the four years that I've been a state's attorney, we've only seen one incident um, where someone was in possession of uh, buprenorphine without a prescription. Now, there are a couple of conclusions that can be drawn, I think, from that. And part of it is to understand how uh, we come across people in possession of illicit substances in Addison County. Most of our possessory offenses occur uh, re related to traffic stops. Um, we don't do a lot of um, you know, what you see the feds do or the drug task force do here in Addison, and that is put together uh, you know, buys and then execute search warrants and so on in this county. We see plenty of crack cocaine. We see plenty of heroin and fentanyl in those traffic stops but we don't see buprenorphine. And uh, I think the reason is twofold. One is that a lot of people who are using uh, this drug illicitly are doing so uh, and otherwise leading lawful lives. They're not engaging in illegal activity. In fact, they're attempting to put their lives back on track, uh, having suffered from an addiction. One thing that <clears throat> many of you probably don't know is that I worked in the music industry for 18 years before I even went to law school. And I've lived and worked around addiction uh, regularly. Uh, many of the people that I worked with in that industry succumbed since to those addictions. And um, when people are in recovery, which comes and goes, oftentimes, um, you know, that is a large focus of their life. And they're trying to do everything to keep themselves on that track. I think the question should be, <clears throat> what's a fair impediment to place in the way of somebody who's seeking to enter into recovery? And I would say none. And I'd be willing to trade you know, one criminal prosecution to save at least one life. And I can guarantee that this drug is saved more than that uh, in the illicit marketplace. Essentially what we're asking people to do is to conform to our model or perhaps die. And that's a terrible equation for someone to have to struggle with. There are impediments uh, to going to the emergency room, one of which, uh, as Sarah mentioned, is the insurance impediment. But there's a greater insurance impediment, and that is that people that have insurance perhaps don't want their addiction to be documented. In addition, there are other issues that may be related to their employment. 
and to, of course, the generalized shame that comes with having an addiction. And a lot of these folks, you got to remember, studies have shown they ended up here not by any fault of their own, but because they were overprescribed pain medications to begin with. And they were seeking uh, heroin or other opiates or opioids in the illicit marketplace when they were cut off by their doctors. And so from my perspective, it seems to be a public health win uh, to decriminalize this particular possessory amount. Uh, first, it's not as widespread as some of us have concerns about. Second, you haven't seen the proliferation that people are concerned about. And look, I get it. I understand the trepidation associated with suddenly, as Senator Sears says, legalizing a substance that was previously not legal. But we haven't seen the proliferation, proliferation here in Addison County. We didn't see it in uh, Chittenden County. And you know we haven't seen it in the DUI drug cases, for example. Um, we see other otherwise uh, prescriptive medicines such as um, benzodiazepine and other uh, Xanax and other prescribed drugs, but we don't see buprenorphine in those persons uh, blood flow nearly as often. I think I've seen one case in the last two years. So finally, what I would say is that uh, we should do everything we can to encourage people to engage in uh, coming off of uh, an otherwise extremely deadly drug. And if part of that includes uh, decriminalizing small amounts of buprenorphine, uh, I'm all for it. Um, if the concern is how do we get people into treatment, we can always uh, you know, pass a statute requiring law enforcement, for example, to refer people to treatment uh, providers uh, when they find them in possession of the amount. But um, in my experience, it's not the best method of getting people to treatment uh, by trying to cudgel them there. They kind of have to come to that decision on their own. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator Hardy and then Senator White. Thank you, Senator Sears. Um, uh, Mr. Wigmans, I saved my questions for you since you're my state's attorney. <laughs> um, well, it's good to hear that this is not a huge issue in our county. Um, I'm curious if you think, it, it sounds like you've seen people with higher amounts of, of other illicit drugs in their system or in their possession than buprenorphine. I, mean, I knew I was not going to be able to orphan. 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 <laughs> <laughs> So do you think if we were to pass this bill, that would switch and there would be more people who have decriminalized bupe than have um, heroin or crack or other illicit substances? Do you, do you understand what I'm trying getting at? I do, know, I, I do understand what you're, what you're getting at. Um, I would say no. And the reason I say that is because, as you point out, these other substances are, are illegal. They're illegal to possess, and people are using them nonetheless. Uh, just because it becomes lawful, first off, Porter Hospital here in our county does uh, provide uh, strips through the emergency room, and a number of people are engaged in that program. We have a very active uh, medically assisted treatment program through the Mountain Health, and we're going to be seeing, I think, another one coming up. We have a walk in program in Virgins. Um, so, you know, I think that. That concern, um, you know, I don't want to call it a false flag, but I just don't see people turning to Bupe when, if they're looking for a kick, uh, they're not going to be looking there. Um, there are a lot more uh, hard drugs that people can turn to that are readily available in the illicit marketplace. I guess I, I didn't say my question quite clearly because um, <laughs> I'm wondering if it actually, I meant it as would it be a good thing that we'd see lower amounts oh, I see what of you're saying. crack and coke and higher uh, usage of bupe, which is, try, is, is ha helping people get off their addiction. Does that? So, uh, yes, I see what you're saying. But you know, the only time it's really going to be coming into play where we uh, in our office become aware of this type of use is probably in a DUI drug case where we've received a blood draw. And as I said, um, we haven't been seeing uh, buprenorphine that often. We've seen, you know, crack methamphetamines. We've seen cocaine methamphetamines. You know, opiates and opioids uh, and other substances. Many of them are, you know, prescriptive medicines. Um, but I don't see. Where I'm going to learn about that, that's probably a better question for people um, that are um, 
administering your analysis for purposes of medically assisted treatment. Okay. And, and I know that we're going to get testimony later on um, about how this is unnecessary because um, people can just go to treatment. And you sort of alluded to that in your testimony. And I'm wondering if you could expand on that, that the sort of availability of treatment and how that um, might interact with this uh, change in the law. Well, you know, um, <clears throat> One of the things that I've noticed about the testimony that's been provided, uh, a lot of it has been from people like me, uh, people like uh, you know, State's Attorney Marthage, who will be presenting testimony later, uh, folks from uh, the law enforcement end of things. What I haven't seen is a lot of people who have been out there uh, you know, dealing with their addiction. Um, you know, I lived with someone who was going through this back in the 90s. Um, you know, he has since relapsed, but then recovered. Each time uh, he turned to street mute first. Um, you know, it, it's really a life-saving, you know, drug in that regard. Um, and from my perspective, as I said, if the concern is whether or not people are going to engage, I think majority are going to engage in a, you know, in a treatment program uh, through the emergency room, but there are some who the stakes are too high for them or they have other concerns where they're not gonna feel comfortable. And so placing that impediment in their way of saying, hey, you know what, if you're caught with this, you're gonna be you know, dragged into the court system um, and that may be leading them to not choosing this, I think is a, a dangerous choice. Um, one that we would be actually encouraging uh, not by uh, you know, decriminalizing, and especially when the stakes are not particularly high as it stands right now. We're not talking about a huge number of criminal cases statewide. Thank you. Thank you. Senator White. I was just going to, thank you, Attorney Wegman. I was just going to um, comment on your your suggestion that we could probably pass a law that says that law enforcement has to refer them to uh, rehab. and. Um, for all the good that would do because we don't have the appropriate rehab facilities anyway. So um, we could pass the law, we could do anything, we could encourage people to go to rehab, but until we have the um, appropriate uh, resources for them, it's not gonna do any good. So the only comment I would say, you know, related to that is if that's an ongoing problem now, I don't see it changing either way. Okay. Um, and I would agree with you that we, you know, don't have a lot of resources um, and we do have limited access to, for example, emergency rooms where people can mm -hmm. kind of start those first steps. Yep. Thank you. I, I've got a, you know, I'm, I'm having a hard time with some of this conversation, so I have to be honest with everyone. Um, <clears throat> Whether you support the bill or not, and I'm trying to be open-minded here, but leading somebody to treatment is not a bad thing. <clears throat> I spent about 40 years of my life with people who didn't want to get treated, trying to treat them. And they resist, obviously. I resist. They resist. But we keep going. And, you know, finally, in about half the cases, they come along. So I just, I have a hard time with the idea that, you know, I always said you can take a horse to water, but you can't make them drink it. But at least if they're around the water, they might decide to drink it. And so I'm having a hard time with some of this conversation, which sort of indicates that, you know, unless somebody is really motivated, they won't seek treatment. You know, one of the biggest complaints I have from emergency responders is when they go to the scene of an overdose and they use the naloxone and the person um, comes back, they refuse treatment and the next night they're back out, you know, in the same situation, same person, same situation. So I just need to say that, um, you know, I'm, again, I'm open-minded about this and also let's Let's be honest, we're legalizing it for people over 21. We're not decriminalizing it we, if we um, pass the House of Task Force. Senator, excuse may I comment on that? Sure. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink it. But you've got to have enough water to begin with. And that's, that is a problem. I think we don't have enough 
enough water, meaning rehab services. Okay. So I'll, I'll just chime in here and I look forward to the testimony that we have today on all of this and knowing that part of our, some of our needs are actually helping people in these situations and having care management systems or case management systems in place. Uh, whether we have sufficient um, support out there through hub and spoke or our DAs, uh, it, it is always problematic. And especially now given the escalation of addiction that's going on. But, um, but I, I wanna hear from folks who, we're going to hear from some folks who are actually on the ground working in, in some of these areas. And I know that we're all, we're all concerned about this. The question about, my question really Lee, goes to the under 21 and under 16 categories that are in the bill and how we're dealing with those two sets of, of folks. So under 16 going to uh, juvenile uh, court and then the other under 21, there's literally no penalty. That, so, that a question for the witness? It is a question for the witness. Do you see uh, any distinction or what kind of distinction do you see in your practice? And thank you for, for being here. Thanks. So, um, well, first, you know, we haven't seen a single case uh, involving juveniles in, in, in Addison County. Um, we, um, you know, do have our largest uh, high school here does have a, a school resource officer um, and we've not seen a, a single case. Um, I don't have a lot of concerns in that area that we're gonna suddenly see, um, you know, because adults can have access to it. Um, as I stated earlier, I think the majority of people are going to, you know, continue uh, to proceed uh, through the emergency room or through a medically assisted treatment program elsewhere. Um, and I didn't mean to uh, imply in any way that I think that um, you know treatment is a bad thing or helping people to get to treatment is a bad thing. Our court and our um, you know state's attorney's office was one of the first ones to fully embrace the pretrial um, you know what, what was called then monitoring program, which is now called the uh, pretrial coordinating program. We refer a very large uh, percentage of our cases uh, to that program and have seen a lot of success out of it. And so uh, I applaud all efforts to help people to, um, you know, head towards treatment. I don't know um, that the adversarial court process is the best means, though, at helping people uh, find treatment where it is available. Um, but as far as the question is concerned, um, as I stated, we don't see it very or at all in our county and perhaps that's been a different experience elsewhere um you know i can't really speak to statewide what's been happening in other our other counties thank you thank Senator you Hardy. thanks and i did, i just want to add to I, I think uh state's attorney wigman's gave a good examples of why people would not or may not feel comfortable seeking treatment at an er or at another medical facility um, for a variety of reasons, um, because of past experiences with the medical system, because of um, issues with employment, because of health insurance, because of um, issues with a uh, criminal record. And so there are a lot of barriers. Um, so just saying that we'd like people to get in treat into treatment um, and that we have resources for it is, is simply not enough for a lot of people. And it's much more complicated than that. Yeah, thank you. It is complicated. Then. Didn't mean to suggest that it wasn't. Um, <clears throat> my first experience with an overdose was 20 years ago. Um, the person who died was 20 years ago on St. Patrick's Day. Um, <clears throat> this has been, and that, so if that's 20 years ago, um, things have only gotten worse. They haven't gotten better, um, I will say. And we've tried an awful lot of things. So. I'll just leave it at that. So. <clears throat> State's Attorney Erica Mathage, uh, Bennington County, and I think your 
part of the executive committee, the Statutory Association. I am. Okay. So uh, this has always been an interesting <coughs> topic for me because I feel like, you know, state's attorneys are not, we are not addiction specialists. Um, we do what you do. We gather our information from people who are, uh, and then we see how some of these um, statutes kind of play out in the community. And, uh, and I am, uh, I'm part of the Bennington County um, opioid leadership team, and we have received uh, a number of federal grants, um, community action grants to work on just this issue. And I'm the chair of the law enforcement subcommittee of that group. And we uh, had a meeting a couple days ago. So I had this conversation with the folks on that call, which included um, a nurse that actually does, uh, she's a in the medication assisted treatment program in Bennington. Uh, Cam Grandy, the um, Lieutenant from the Bennington Police Department. Uh, and then a number of other uh, treatment providers, the um, case worker for Turning Point um, it was on the call, which is our, uh, um, essentially they, you know, they're the sobriety group in Bennington. They help with, uh, resources and connecting people. It's mostly volunteer. We've been running um, for probably a year now, a project with them, with Turning Point, where uh, if anyone does uh, overdose um, law enforcement or, or EMTs, so it's not always necessarily the police, when they respond, the uh, Turning Point responds as well. And uh, that's been extremely helpful from my perspective uh, with, in and from hearing from law enforcement, the police officers uh, genuinely appreciate having someone from Turning Point there. What I find interesting about this bill is uh, there's been a lot of testimony about it being, you know, um, and I think the word miracle was used. I mean, what I would say is we don't criminalize it now. It's really not, I've never prosecuted it even once. Um, it comes in maybe uh, as uh, S.A. Weigman said with a, a DUI case um, as a secondary charge, but clearly not something that the, I think the community is deterred, currently deterred by the criminality of it. So, um, but again, that's my experience. I speak for uh, myself and a handful of the um, essays that are on the executive committee, because uh, we also talked about this uh, at our meeting yesterday. So for me, it ultimately really comes down to, um, I completely agree with Senator Sears, I, in that we need to be getting individuals into uh, treatment. And I think that it is highlighted, this does highlight the need for more treatment availability and more uh, programs. Um, however, you know, there are a number of other things going on. The, the federal government has approved telehealth, you know, and it's been this way for all of 2020. So for the entire calendar year of 2020, individuals were uh, able to go through telehealth for uh, medication assisted treatment. And um, turning point, hands out information about that. They assist, we have multiple programs that assist people with getting uh, insurance. I spoke with the nurse that does medication assisted treatment and asked her how many of the people coming in, new clients coming in for treatment have been using uh, buprenorphine off the street essentially for their own treatment. Um, the number was significant. She's like, it's probably like 80% of the people that come to her have already either used in the past or are currently using non-prescribed buprenorphine, um, which I thought I was surprised. Uh, she talked about the stigma around going in and getting evaluated. Uh, obviously, I don't think the stigma is attaching to the cases where folks are overdosing and the law enforcement community is responding uh, multiple times in a week. Um, 
you know, we had one young lady who overdosed three times in a week and had to be, uh, they had to use Narcan on her. And each time she declined any kind of um, follow up with turning point. So I think that for me, this is a tough one. Cause again, I'm not an addiction, an addiction specialist. So what I come down to for me is I am a cost benefit person at my very core. I look at every decision in my life in that cost benefit kind of evaluation. When I spoke with, and I think Senator Sears is familiar with some of the um, mothers in ben in uh, Bennington County have you know created Fed Up of Vermont. And so the Fed Up ladies, I reached out to them. They're all mothers that have lost, either lost a child to addiction or have a child uh, that's addicted. And uh, of the four of them, they have strong opinions about medication assisted treatment that they're not actually fans of um, that process for uh, to achieve sobriety. However, they look at it exactly like I do. If we don't prosecute it, it's not removing any tools from my toolbox, kind of regardless of what you all do with it. Um, but if it saves one life, it could be worth it. Um, and to me, that one life outweighs any benefit that I might get um, from having this tool in my toolbox. Now, all that said, I love uh, S.A. Weigman's idea about um, not diversion. I would not argue for diversion. I would say um, that it's more like a pre-trial or pre-charge situation, you know, I don't, I, I agree. I don't think getting the state's attorney's office involved in these kinds of cases leads to um, positive outcomes. I just, I don't. We refer every, every case, unless you are dealing or trafficking in heroin, we refer every single case to treatment diversion. More than half of them uh, fail out. But the half that don't, we're making those connections. And anybody who's ever dealt, what I do know about addiction is that it's cyclical, right? We're going to go through periods of sobriety and relapse multiple, multiple times over the course of someone's life. Uh, yeah. That's the hardest thing. When I look at someone who's 25 who was addicted, even if they get uh, into treatment and they're sober, I always think in the back of my head, this is something that they're going to struggle with for the rest of their lives. It doesn't just go away. All of a sudden, it's not like you're cured from addiction. So um, I feel like this is a, it really is a philosophical decision for the legislators that are making, that are looking at this bill and the governor. I mean, it's a, is it, and I com also completely agree that it's not decriminalizing it, it's legalizing it. There's a difference. Um, I don't, I think there were a lot of kind of speculative things, what was going to happen when we legalized small amounts of marijuana. Uh, I, don't, I don't see that the sky never fell, but I also don't see that we got rich off that prospect. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think it really is something that you all need to hear from the experts and uh, we, the state's attorneys are not the experts. I'm not, um, I don't think it's our place to take a position on uh, this type of legislation because it really is so tightly tied to uh, addiction and, and how people deal with it. And I think the Department of Health is really the one that um, should be looked to for any expert testimony about this. Appreciate that. I, I have a couple of questions and then I'll go to Senator Lyons. Erica, thanks so much for being with us this morning. Um, and I will point out one of the advantages of Zoom is you don't have to drive from Manchester to oh, Montpelier. Right? Um, and I'm wearing but, jeans, I'll tell you. Well, my bottom half is jeans. <laughs> well, I'm wearing shorts, if we're going to be honest. <laughs> um, but anyway, that wasn't what I was going to ask you about. Um, one of the frustrations that I've had, and we've talked about it, as well as the opiate mis or the uh, substance misuse group that you spoke of, I've been to several of those meetings and they're very aggressive. 
for Bennington County, there is no um, more, uh, methadone treatment available unless you go out of state, either Green or Brattleboro, while well, you're in state in Brattleboro, but it feels like out of state, or Greenfield, Mass, or North Adams, Mass. That is a huge void in our district. Um, yep. And while I've got the Health and Welfare Committee here, I, I don't want to leave without letting you know how difficult that is. Um, I had to work with the Corrections Department to allow probationers and people on other statuses to leave the state in order to get methadone treatment. I mean, it is ridiculous. And here, and here is, I had to work with the DCF because we have so many folks that are in treatment that uh, are involved in family court that don't have driver's licenses or they don't have uh, transportation. And getting to North Adams, this was not something I knew about. DCF for the longest time couldn't use vouchers to cross into another state. So that to me is really ludicrous. Aside I just wanted mind. to raise that as impediments to treatment in our area. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, Senator Lyons had a question for uh, State's Attorney Marthy. Um, thank you. Actually, it's a question that I would ask of each of the state's attorneys and just knowing the, you know, the progression that we look at in investing in prevention or intervention, treatment, and then recovery. And it sounds like you're, uh, the recovery piece for you uh, in Bennington through the Turning Point Center is, um, is a very close link. And I, I think having those links in with the designated agencies for treatment um, are equally important. But I think as we all understand the funding in each of those areas is, uh, could be improved. To, oh, turning to point, uh, Senator. Turning point. The the they trained probably fifteen uh, volunteers um, <clears throat> last year just for this project, and it's really been astounding. Ju yes. Julia Larson is on the agenda. She's from the local Bennington Turning. Point. Right. She's going to be coming in a little bit later, yeah. so we'll you know we'll hear more about the program. But I <clears throat> I. You know, and I and I understand that you've identified the time frame for recovery it can be seven years, and it's also the critical time for whether or not someone will commit suicide. There's all of those terrible considerations. So, I guess my question for each of you is: is how I hear from from you, um, Attorney Marthage, about Turning Point Center. And I hear from uh, Mr. Wiggins, Wigmans that there isn't a huge problem in Addison County, at least for this particular drug. Uh, but and also um, our state's attorneys, George in Chittenden County. But what linkages do you have for treatment and recovery? And in particular, that you're seeing for folks who are, have um are using the buprenorphine it's a pretty open question but i think it's an important one because yeah i i agree i and and i don't i want to make sure that um the committee understands i it is a huge problem in bennington i <laughs> it's a huge problem but we don't i don't prosecute it because i don't um police don't bring these cases to me they see people all the time. I asked the lieutenant about this yesterday, um, but we don't prosecute them. We hand them a card. You know, we have these cards for turning point that we hand out. Uh, the The linkage, so, so as Senator Sears indicated, he's been to a few of these meetings. The, the Bennington uh, opiate, opioid leadership team has been probably the only group I've been on in the last 20 years. <laughs> I have one other in the back of my mind, the juvenile working group that I'm on, that we have really um, done good work. It, the linkages there have been, honestly, the hospital is the one that took the lead. They organized, um, 
I'm not sure, I think Senator Sears was at the um, meeting that Representative Welch came to uh, probably four years ago. And mm -hmm. there were like 30 of us there just pleading with him that we needed resources, we needed um, really to come together. And the president of the hospital at the time, um, Tom D just took that and ran with it. Like, and I was very impressed, I have to say, because the hospitals, um, you know, they're helpful, obviously, uh, so, but they're not typically the leader on this kind of issue. Mm -hmm. And I felt like it really made sense. Like they loaned us a grant writer, they gave us a space, they organized all of the meetings. Like they really went above and beyond. Um, and I think that st is what really started creating those linkages, right? We started, the woman who runs our CRJ was on the, was is always at these meetings. She's actually on the law enforcement subcommittee. The public defender is on the law enforcement subcommittee, um, the lieutenant, and we really talk about it, but the hospital facilitates all of these meetings. And we talk about how do we make these connections? And I'm sure that's what, Julie is going to have a lot to say about that because obviously they, they've been really a key component of that, um, that connection. But yeah, that's it. Like, how do you stave off uh, an overdose death while we're trying to get people into recovery? That's really what it comes down to. Uh, do I think that legalizing buprenorphine is going to have some huge impact on that? I don't actually, <laughs> but I also don't think it's going to hurt. Um, just because I think if if we can do anything that's going to make it um, easier for folks to uh, not use heroin, <laughs> that that's uh, where we need to go. So, Sarah or Dennis, do you want to comment to the question? I can I can just chime in really quickly. I agree. Our hospital has definitely been a big part of the success um, in terms of getting more doctors prescribed. I'm very hopeful that with the new um, national mandate of waiving the the obstacles that doctors have is going to mean even more doctors can prescribe, and so even more people can um, get prescriptions. Safe recovery in our community, our syringe exchange program has also been a huge part of that. Um, Dr. Blake, you know, who lost her son Sean um, to an overdose, has been a, has been huge in just making sure she can get as many people prescribed as possible. Um, but one thing I just, you know, I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that there are so many people in our community that are not ready for that full um, abstinence and or even a full uh, use of MAT. There are a lot of people who are are just in the middle there and a lot of them aren't quite ready for that because of the underlying trauma that has led to their use and so until we really get great mental health services and co-occurring services for people that are also um, using because of extreme trauma <coughs> people may just continue to use buprenorphine illicitly one day and use heroin the next and then use buprenorphine and we have to be okay with that we have to understand that that's part of getting into recovery and that not everybody is at that um, end level or end you know, place yet. And in the meantime, every single time that they pick Suboxone, even if it's not their prescription, is a time they are not gonna die from fentanyl. So you know, I am really sick of getting autopsy reports in my inbox every day from people in my community dying from fentanyl. Um, people are not dying from Suboxone. And that's frankly, at the end of the day, what this bill acknowledges and, um, you know, tells the community. Thank you. Um, so treatment just, options, I'm sorry. No, go <laughs> ahead. I, I, I'll ask my question after you've had an opportunity to respond. Sure. Uh, treatment options in Addison County, um, as I stated earlier, uh, Porter Hospital, which is part of the UVM Medical Center <laughs> um, system, um, you know, since they became part of that system has been providing a uh, walk-in through the emergency room. Valley Vista has a walk-in uh, in Virgin's. Uh, Mountain Health in Bristol um, is tied in with, um, within the community both, both there, but also they have a, a van. Uh, and so they've been uh, mobile. Um, you know, part of the problem is that as um, 
Senator Lyons mentioned, we, you know, we don't have enough water in our community. Um, there, we have a, at least two or three towns uh, in Addison County that are on the other side of the Green Mountains. Um, and those towns, um, you know, their access to services is very limited. Um, you know, uh, and that's where we see part of the issue is that we have a lot of people that live very remotely that don't have a great deal of access. Uh, Turning Point is under new leadership in our county and also partners with the uh, Mountain Health uh, folks, but they've largely been focusing on, um, you know, housing as a, as a need that needs to be met in Addison County. In addition, the Counseling Services of Addison County just hired uh, a street uh, organizer to help reach out, you know, to homeless folks that are living in our county uh, to provide them or to link them with services, but also to get them into some of the you know, limited housing opportunities uh, that we have. So, so did you have another question, Senator Lyon? Gary, it's really a quick question. It's not something that you actually need to respond to right away, but with all of the investment that you're making in, uh, in time, working with your advisory groups, uh, working with your local uh, treatment centers, uh, recovery centers, and um, you have recommendations to make both to judiciary as well as to health and welfare. And I remember several years ago when we were hearing testimony from people driving every morning for two hours to get to the methadone clinic and then driving home, going to work, and then the next day doing exactly the same thing. That at least ha has been improved, but now I'm hearing that Bennett Bennington County- It's not improved in Bennington. Has a broken no. system. So if the, this, these kinds of recommendations that you can send to us will help us as we develop our policies as well as our budget. And I know that Senator Sears and I both were very invested in having recovery centers receive funding during the pandemic and that, that's happened, but these, these issues don't end and the need for improvements don't end. So any suggestions that you have, I would certainly welcome those in my inbox. So. I, I will just say that it, it's, not, it's not all the fault of the state that Bennington doesn't have nothing in. Um, several years ago, myself and a few others tried to get methadone started, and the local uh, groups were so opposed to the idea that we'd have methadone in Bennington County. They shot it down. It wasn't until um, really the hospital changed hands to um, D and others that we started to see an interest in having methadone available. Um, actually, North Adams is not that far. Um, from Bennington. It just happens to be in another state, which makes the transportation all that more difficult. Um, but it was, it's not all the fault of the state um, that we don't have nothing known yet. Um, and then when the turning, when the um, state developed the hub and spoke, we were part of Rutland. Uh, but Rutland had such a demand for methadone that by the time Bennington was able to get in, all the slots were already filled. And it's very far from Bennington. Yeah, yeah and that's really further than, but, but at the time that the Rutland operation opened, right. um, our only other option was Greenfield Mass. And the, and the, and the that, other, you know, we talk about um, working, you know, you have to get up and drive two hours and go to your treatment and then go to work. There's another piece of it. Uh, a lot of the folks that um, that I do see are the ones that have concurrent criminal charges for, you know, maybe burglary or a driving offense, something related in criminal court. Then they have a family court case where their children have been uh, taken into DCF custody and they have a case plan that they have to meet. And so it's, it is uh, not lost on me that there are a lot of days that I'm um, in juvenile court listening to the social workers say, well, they only made this percentage of meetings, but 
some of those days they've been on the bus all day <laughs> riding over to Brattleboro and coming home and they don't, um, they, there just aren't enough hours in the day to meet your DCF case plan, your DOC requirements and your treatment. So, um, but I mean, Senator Sears is absolutely right. I remember when we, when that all happened with the methadone clinic and it was, uh, it, I think there was some fear that if we bring a methadone clinic, it's somehow going to change the face of, you know, the population in Bennington. It's going to bring addicts to us, not like that we didn't already have them. <laughs> so I, I thought that was really unfortunate. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I was surprised I got reelected. Anyway, <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, thank you all three states attorneys very much. Um, we really appreciate hearing from you. You're on the front lines dealing with it day in, day out, um, I'm, with it being a significant drug problem that Vermont faces and that other states face, and that associated crime that goes with them. Um, thank you. Next, and we can't forget law enforcement. And, um, we have the Commissioner of Public Safety uh, next, um, Mike Schurling. Um, and good morning, Mike, and welcome to this nice hearing. Uh, we appreciate it and uh, for being here. Um, uh, so I'm going to just kind of throw it open to you and, and uh, your views on it. Um, as a former chief of police in uh, the city of Burlington, um, I know you have expertise and as a law enforcement officer as well as commissioner. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thanks for having me in this morning. Uh, I agree with uh, many of the points made by the state's attorneys, although I uh, will offer a bit of a different view on what we believe a more pragmatic path forward uh, could look like uh, to address this, this issue. And uh, I know you have Dr. Levine scheduled in an hour or so, and uh, he'll add um, uh, quite a bit of additional detail from the public health perspective that dovetails into uh, uh, the perspective that we're bringing from public safety and, and the actual conditions on the street. And I, I would just uh, remind folks that uh, less than 10% of the day-to-day -day responses uh, of public safety organizations, whether that's uh, law enforcement or uh, fire or EMS service, um, make it to um, uh, a prosecutor's desk. So the, the field of view is substantially different uh, from street level first responders. Um, that's not to diminish the, the prosecutor's view, but ju just to, to flag for you that it is a, a, at least a tenfold increase in the number of events um, that we have our eyes on in any, uh, any given time period, whether that's a week, a month, or a year. Um, our shared goal, of course, is better outcomes, um, reduction of overdoses, uh, getting more people into treatment, enhancing access to treatment. And for all those reasons, this really at, at its core is a public health issue, not a law enforcement or criminal justice issue. But it's important to note from the outset that buprenorphine is not only a treatment drug, but it also is a drug of abuse. So unlike Narcan, which is used to reverse overdoses, buprenorphine can be used as a drug of abuse. And uh, equally important, it can be used by those, you know, what creates the diversion market is diversion. It's sale of buprenorphine, often by people who it's been prescribed to, uh, to fuel the purchase of, of other things. Um, so again, I offer that as background for some of the things I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, it's been noted already that what's contemplated here uh, in terms of the number of milligrams is beyond a smidge as the, as you mentioned, Senator, it's a, a one to two week supply of buprenorphine, um, which is substantive when you talk about, or when you contemplate what that could look like relative to, to diverting um, that level of, of possession. Um, we believe that uh, achieving a balance in ensuring access to those who need treatment and assuring accountability for those who are um, doing nefarious things with, uh, with buprenorphine is, um, is also uh, a key piece of this conversation. Um, it, it struck me as I was listening to, to the discussion this morning that 
encouraging people to uh, possess buprenorphine for treatment is an admirable goal. Encouraging them to purchase something on the street on an illicit market um, is problematic from a number of uh, perspectives. First, it is not uncommon for people to be purchasing street drugs and not get what they signed up for um, or to have what they signed up for be cut or altered in some manner that makes it either more hazardous or less impactful as a treatment if that is the underlying goal. Um, additionally, uh, uh, State's Attorney George gave an example of a prosecution in a hotel room with a myriad of drugs that were uh, um, seized simultaneously. That is the norm. Um, drug dealers don't typically deal in one drug at a time. And by dealing in diverted buprenorphine, it's something that creates uh, cash flow that allows them to continue dealing in other substances as well. So again, I just provide that as, uh, as background. Um, the, the to, to get to sort of the meat of this, each time, although the number of times we encounter people in possession of buprenorphine cases is not high, um, the, uh, each time we encounter someone, it is an opportunity to uh, try to lead that horse to water to get treatment. And in uh, decriminalizing or legalizing it and foregoing that opportunity, we do lose an opportunity to get people connected um, to treatment. Now, we've talked a little bit, or there's been testimony earlier this morning about programs to um, sort of step into that void, but unfortunately in Vermont, those are hit and miss. And we don't have a statewide systemic approach to getting people into treatment um, at all opportunities where they intersect um, the, the, I'll say the public safety system, not necessarily the criminal justice system, when they're in the back of an ambulance, when they're um, uh, at a fire scene, when they're um, interacting with law enforcement, um, not only in cases where they may be possessing or even dealing drugs to support a habit, uh, but also in that 90 plus percent of other responses that can be anything from a landlord tenant dispute to a disorderly conduct to a retail theft, where uh, having immediate access to treatment would be uh, significantly beneficial, treatment on demand, which I think is our, our overarching goal, but one that has been elusive for the couple of decades that our, uh, our heroin uh, problem has been uh, burgeoning and, and problematic. Uh, so weave all of that background together to say this, that um, we believe that a better approach would be to continue to use the structure of the criminal justice system, not the prosecutorial aspect of it, but the structure of the system um, to encourage people to get into treatment and to have an opportunity to unpack their underlying issues in a more robust way by doing something like diversion, um, whether it's true diversion or it's some other mechanism uh, each one of these uh, encounters, if we don't take advantage of it as a lost opportunity uh, to try to save a life, to try to impact not only the person who's subject to the addiction, but all of their family, friends, um, work, et cetera, um, and you know, distancing ourselves from that responsibility um, is an easy policy approach, but it, it strikes me as not the right one. Um, we should be engaging more, not engaging less. So um, yeah, I, there, I have a number of additional notes, but I think at some point it becomes a little, little redundant. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. And if there are, um, there are questions, uh, I'll just end with um, doing something like that rather than straight decriminalization um, would enable better tracking of the issue. It would enable a pipeline to treatment and it would allow us to assess outcomes and make treatment referrals in a way that simply going hands off and, and, and encouraging people to buy things on the black market, which I believe is hazardous. Um, just that approach does not allow for those kinds of things. Thank you. Um, I don't know how many of you received uh, suggested language uh, or a change from Commissioner Sterling. I, I did, um, Senator Lyons, you did. 
Peggy or Nellie, do we have a copy of that that could be posted or printed um, out? Yep, it is on the website, um, but I can pull it up right now if you want. Both websites or? It should be on health and welfare as well, yes. Oh, okay, thank you, Nellie. Oh, I'm seeing your email. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all right with us. <laughs> um, but it is on the website. Do you want me to try and pull it up? Yeah, could you please? Sure. Uh, while Peggy's pulling it up, um, Commissioner, if we went in your direction, why wouldn't we do that for people under over the age of 16 and under the age of 21? That'd certainly be at your discretion, Senator. Um, the, the framing was originally designed around uh, statutes in Title 33 that uh, encourage or direct diversion for certain kinds of offenses. So, you know, that, that framing is malleable depending on the policy goals. I'm having a little trouble here. Sorry, guys. Not a problem. In the meantime, are there questions for Commissioner Sherwood? Senator Hardy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Commissioner Sherling, for your testimony. I'm curious, I don't understand your um, sort of take on the bill that it is encouraging a hands-off kind of approach rather than an engagement approach. Um, it doesn't, I don't read it as that. I just read it as, as saying we're not, we're not going to criminalize the possession of something. It doesn't mean we're not going to help the person if we find out that they are possessing um, buprenorphine. It just means we're not going to arrest and prosecute them. So I, I don't understand your take on the hands-off approach of it. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, thank you. The so in the field, um, you come across someone who's in possession of buprenorphine. Um, what do you do next? It, our system beyond the ability to refer someone, in, in this case, what we're suggesting is into the system and then to diversion where the diversion board can, um, can uh, both direct and then ultimately monitor uh, treatment or some parallel version of that potentially, although unfortunately those parallel versions don't exist statewide. Absent that, um, the first responders who are there are just walking away in most cases. Uh, there are hit or miss programs, a couple of them have been described to you uh, earlier this morning, where referrals can be made, but by and large, we do not have the ability and access to treatment on demand uh, in Vermont. So the, it will be a lost opportunity. So, and and do you think that putting the person in to diversion will help that? I, I mean, I don't understand how that's just sort of using the, and I understand that the diversion program is not directly the criminal justice system, but it, it is a part of the criminal justice system. And, and how is that more helpful than helping the person, you know, access treatment, uh, an MAT program or medical treatment? It's an additional option of sort of connective tissue to programs. So the, the diversion program has access uh, to a variety of different uh, mechanisms that they can leverage to, uh, to shuttle cases to successful fruition through the diversion program. Again, it's, it's the only statewide program that we've got to use as a model. Um, there, you know, we could, you, there are other ways to do this. We just don't have um, a statewide version of another way to do it uh, right now. I, I will take this opportunity to promote in our modernization uh, plan that we put forth last January, uh, one section of it, which is available on our website, dps.vermont.gov forward slash modernization, shows a construct for a criminal justice and public health system that is designed to do exactly what we're talking about here. Uh, engage people with prevention and education first, outreach and intervention, treatment options second, alternative sanctions, and then finally courts and corrections. The sooner we work toward a systemic approach like that, the better outcomes we're gonna have. We continue to attack this piecemeal and look at decriminalizing this or a tiny treatment pilot program here we're going to continue to struggle with uh, good outcomes. 
And, and I think each time the state, uh, it, this isn't anybody's fault. It's the piecemeal approach to, to the way we do business in state government typically. And I've watched this now for almost three decades or more than three decades. We keep taking steps back from engaging uh, and, and disinvesting instead of uh, going in the opposite direction. Mr. Chair, may I ask a question? Yep, yeah, sure. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, a couple things. I, I, I do believe that when you um, reference the modernization plan that um, this, in, in my mind, this really is um, responding to steps one and two. It is, um, it, or it can be responding to steps one and two. And one of the things that I remember that we heard in the testimony on whether or not we should um, decriminalize the penalty for uh, marijuana was that many, many, many people told us that the biggest problem that people had was getting involved in the criminal justice system. That the, the, um, their use of marijuana was a problem and could be dealt with, but the real problem came in when they got involved into the criminal justice system and it, can, it tends to spiral downward. They get involved, then they are on diversion or on probation or whatever, they have a violation that escalates and it just continues to spiral downward. And so it seems to me that, that just even getting people involved in the criminal justice system in this case is um, a, <clears throat> can lead to the uh, downward spiral for that person. Yeah, I don't disagree with that, Senator. I, I think that is an, an accurate representation of what happens to some people. Um, let me back up a, a step and, and sort of bifurcate my description here. Uh, if our overarching goal is to get buprenorphine into the hands of people who need it for treatment uh, through lawful means, then we should expand the mechanisms available to us so that people can walk into a pharmacy and get buprenorphine on demand um, through prescription or referral or whatever the case may be but not encourage them to go to the street drug dealer who is using those profits to do something even more illicit or potentially handing them something that isn't buprenorphine or has been altered in some fashion. Um, it, the, if the public policy is to get it in the hands of more people, which we agree with, then we should find a mechanism to do that. This is not that mechanism. On the other side of the, of the uh, equation, what I'm suggesting is for those who then choose to go get it, from an illicit source, um, getting them into some kind of program. In this case, again, the only one we've got access to at the moment that's statewide is diversion um, to monitor uh, and encourage them to get correct treatment rather than street treatment, then that's, that's the other lane of travel. But first and foremost, as I, as I started uh, my testimony, this is a public health issue. We should be developing a system that gets them on-demand access to treatment, and if the right treatment is buprenorphine, gets that in their hand as swiftly as possible so they're not going to the local hotel to buy it. I, I agree with you. I would expand this right. to say we should um, have allow pharmacies to uh, dispense um, it. Well, but I don't think we're going to go there. That's a, a pretty big you. step for most people to take, but um, and we did hear that it will allow, that we are now allowing more doctors to prescribe. So that's a step. It doesn't have to be just on demand in um, pharmacies, but um, more and more people could, could access it. And, and there are the issues about that uh, um, attorney Wigman pointed out about the um, people not wanting it on their insurance policy, they because of employment issues and all kinds of stuff. So I, yeah, I, I understand your point. I disagree with it, but I understand it. Oh. Excuse me. I, um, I, so, excuse me. I, I, that was an editorial comment, but let me, okay, let me just I'm gonna, go right. ahead and I'll have a comment. Can we, take so the, just, can we take the share screen down so we can see each other better? Um, 
actually, I wanted to have you take a, I wanted to be able to take a look at that. That's why I put it up there. And then oh, okay. We ended up going somewhere I'll, I'll else. Wait, I'll and wait until we've gone I, I was this. only, with Senator White, was only, I, you know, we've, we've been together for so many years on the, on the Judiciary Committee that I'm used to the polite way she tells somebody that she doesn't mean it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, Commissioner, if you could just briefly uh, go through while we have the shared screen up and then we can take it down. Uh, unfortunately, Senator, I'm on a phone, so the shared screen is, oh, uh, is like this big. <laughs> so okay, well, your proposal, <laughs> all right, so, but anyway, your proposal is that we, tre we create a presumption of diversion for the possession of 224 milligrams or less and that someone who um, is um, arrested for the possession of 224 milligrams or less would be referred directly to court diversion by a state's attorney unless state's attorney states on the record why a referral to court diversion would not serve the ends of justice. That's basically your proposal. Got it. That's correct. So you're trying to get people into treatment. Then we get into the discussion of how to make buprenorphine available on demand. Um, and I was reminded of the days when Nicorette gum was only available by prescription. Um, and then miracle, miracle, miracles happen and now you can buy it without, prescri without a prescription. Um, I should be clear, Senator, uh, not advocating it to be over the counter because, again, it is a potential drug of abuse and it does have well, um, much more significant impacts than uh, than um, Nicorette. But uh, I understood having but, the healthcare system able to do it more swiftly is what I'm advocating. Yeah. And the other advantage to having it by prescription was your insurance paid for it. Yes. Which is what I was going to mention. All right. Um, we've taken the shared screen down and Senator Hardy has a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It, it seems to me, Commissioner, that this actually would go in the opposite direction and it would get more people into the criminal justice system um, rather than fewer people into the criminal justice system. And I, I, I agree with Senator White that we want to be making it easier for people to access treatment not through the criminal justice system. And I understand that you're trying to have a path because you don't feel like there's a path to treatment, but this seems to go in the opposite direction. Ooh. And and what I heard from State's Attorney George, and I wanted to hear your comment about this, is that there was recently some federal um, change in uh, for physicians being able to uh, uh, prescribe buprenorphine and that that would actually do what you're suggesting is have um, many more legal options for getting the prescription. She also said that when she announced publicly that she would stop prosecuting the possession of it, many more physicians were avail uh, you know, came forward to offer treatment and offer prescriptions. So it, it seems to me that by decriminalizing it, we're actually um, encouraging more in the medical community to feel comfortable um, prescribing and working with patients um, who are ready for treatment. Um, and using the court diversion program is actually putting more people into the court system. Uh, I understand the argument, but as Sen uh, I'll, use, I'll paraphrase Senator White, I don't agree with it. Um, I think the, um, what I'm suggesting is we create a system where people can get access to it through the, the healthcare system and not have to go to the black market. But when they do go to the black market, that then we step in and we have a system to shepherd them along. In this case, what's proposed is diversion. I don't see that as increasing the number of cases, uh, especially, hopefully we get the number of cases to zero if we can build the requisite healthcare access that I'm describing. Could I ask? No, Senator White. Could, could oh, I'm I ask? sorry, Senator Lyons wanted to speak. Oh, and I, okay. Um, she's been anxiously awaiting. Yeah, no, uh, listen, this is what we're talking about is a medical condition. Addiction is a medical condition and it is a public health imperative to treat this medical condition. So having 
resources available and links available when people are run into the uh, public safety or judicial system, having resources available to keep them out of that system, I think are abs it's absolutely critical and important. We've been trying to work on this for years with our uh, prevention council and our prevention work in the Department of, of Public Health that crosses the silos of state government. And we've also been working on this with our social workers, or responsive social workers in our local communities. Uh, and so the, the mobile crisis units and so on. So there's a lot going on, but I'm what we're hearing is that when one person is stopped in a traffic stop, that there's not a direct link for that person to get medical support. That's what we're hearing. Or to get to the DAs or to get to someone who can at least uh, help that person and perhaps the person can then follow a path, whether it's direct or indirect. The, the whole uh, issue about prescribing buprenorphine that's come down from the federal government, I think is an improvement. The other thing that we did recently in our legislation was uh, during the COVID was to allow for prescription with re-prescription renewal without office visit. And so that's, that's, con that's helping people. Uh, but I think what, um, Commissioner, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but what you're suggesting is simply having more linkages for people outside of the judicial system. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. Uh, so whether the bill as written is the way to go or whether there are, whether it's a first step uh, or whether your bill is the first step, we need to continue to identify A, additional resources and B, uh, those links. So. Thank you, Senator. I, I would also offer, uh, and Dr. Levine would be the correct person to speak more to this, but there are instances I imagine where the correct treatment profile for someone isn't buprenorphine and you need the medical provider to be able to assess that instead of, um, you know, Joe Smith, the drug dealer at the Holiday Inn. Senator White wants to stand up for the Holiday Inn in this room. <laughs> no, but I was, this might be getting too much into the ways, but Commissioner, you uh, suggested that um, if people that, if we had a better system for people to be able to get it um, legally with a prescription through the health system, that would be great. But then when they get it from the from, as a street drug, that that's when we sh they should enter into the criminal justice system in some form. And I, this might be too much in the weeds, but does that mean that the person would have to carry their prescription around with them? All the time. I mean, how how would a law enforcement person finds out that somebody has, and I think they're called strips of buprenorphine, and <clears throat> how would they determine whether they should write the write a ticket for the guy, arrest him? When um, Senator, when uh, it's a great question. When um, when people have prescriptions, uh, there's a prescription label on the container. Um, nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100, probably more accurately, or probably 999 out of 1,000, when you find a drug, uh, whether it's Oxycontin or buprenorphine or something that's outside its prescription container, it's been obtained illicitly. So it's a pretty straightforward uh, equation in the field. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, really appreciate the testimony and, and your thoughts on how to deal with this problem. I, one of the problems we still face, I think, as a state, and as a nation, is there are those who see medically assisted treatment as not being the ideal. That's in the treatment world. So we've had, in some areas of the state, where turning point clubs, for example, um, we had the treatment programs, which um, would not take somebody who was medically on Medicaid assisted treatment, medical tr assisted treatment. Um, so you've got that also in, involved there. Um, 
I'm, um, I don't know if there's any more questions for Commissioner Sherling. Um, and if we could, I think we're at a top point where we might want to take a short break and come back at 10.15 if we could. So, because we only got 40, uh, we have to quit at 11.25, I would say, so we can get to the Senate floor, unfortunately, they half an hour away from us. Are we coming back to this? This um, Yeah, at, at, okay. say it. Would everybody agree to five minutes and come back at 10.15 and begin um, taking more testimony? Um, realize it's short. So we've got, um, I'm hoping that Dr. Richter and um, Dr. Levine, and I see Brenda Siegel is here, so we'll begin with her. So okay, well, you're gonna, good. you're gonna handle the next half of the meeting, Senator Lyons. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Thank you. Senator Sears. Thank you all. <laughs>